Now let's go to Samantha's question, who has a bit of overwhelm about prioritizing tasks on her to-do list. Hi, Mel. It's Samantha. My question is, how do you prioritize everything in daily life without stress and anxiety taking over? I find myself overwhelmed thinking about everything I need to do throughout the day and then throw in extra appointments and tasks on top of that, and then I end up pushing it off in hopes that I get it done the next day. I'm just looking for that happy balance. Yes, Samantha. Whoo, I hear you. You have what I call lifestyle overwhelm. And this involves a lie that we all tell ourselves that leads to a lot of overwhelm. And the lie is everything is important. And here's what I want you to understand. If everything is important, nothing is important. All those things that you have on your to-do list do not have equal weight. And so here's what I want you to do. You're going to go from being stressed out all the time because you're giving equal weight to everything to having a more strategic way of approaching your day-to-day life and the things that you need to get done. And so the tool that I'm going to give you is something that I use all the time. I call it a brain dump, okay? It's so simple. It costs you nothing. You can do it several times a day. Anybody can use this. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to take out a blank piece of paper. I don't care if it's lined or it's printer paper or it's the flip side of a bill that you just paid. And you're going to take that piece of paper and you are going to vomit everything on that paper that is in your brain. Absolutely everything. Okay. And you can just dump it all out there. And if you want to get fancy pants with this, you can draw a line down the center of the paper and you can write important stuff on the left and shit I can do later on the right, okay? But you don't even need to do that. I'm just adding that in there because I know a lot of our listeners are very, very, very like kind of, I like to keep things organized, Mel. No problem. You can add a little pizzazz to your brain dump. I personally, I'm so scatterbrained with the ADHD that I just need a blank piece of paper and I just dump it all down there. And so let me think about today what would be on my list. Oh, um packing for Boston, calling my daughter to remind me, remind her that it's uh, dinner's at 7.30. I got to check in for the plane ticket. I got to make sure that, um, uh, oh, I haven't even looked at the weather yet. So I don't even know what to pack for Boston. I don't know what it's going to be like in New York when we land there Saturday to support another friend who's doing this concert. Oh, I didn't even pick up my ADHD prescription yet. And I need to get that on the way out of town. And so you can see that just like you, I suffer from not only legitimate overwhelm right now, but I also have a case of lifestyle overwhelm, that I overwhelm myself because I manage all this crap on my head. So you feel a sense of lifestyle overwhelm, brain dump everybody. Get it out of your head and get it down on a piece of paper. Because when you can get it down on a piece of paper, you can be more strategic about creating a system to get it done. And it feels so good to do this. When you're managing all this stuff in your head, ugh, this is why going for a walk with a friend is so therapeutic. Not only are you outside, but as you're walking and talking, you know what you're doing? You're brain dumping. You're getting all that stuff that you've been ruminating about out into the air. And when you get it out on a piece of paper by doing a brain dump, like just pour it all out there. That's what you need to do. I was about to tell you 15 other things that just came to mind because what what starts happening when you do a brain dump is it's sort of like pulling a thread on a sweater. That sucker just keeps on going. So don't be surprised if there are some days that you fill three pages. So now what do you do now that you've dumped it all out on a piece of paper? You're going to take a highlighter and you're going to highlight the three things that you must do today. These are your priority. This is what's important. So what are the three things I need to do today? I need to pick up my prescription. I need to pack for Boston. And I need to work on this eulogy. Those are the only three things that matter. And you want to know something fascinating about life is that if you just can dump everything out and you can highlight the three things that really matter that you get to them today, If there's an emergency or if something else is a true priority, have you ever noticed it gets your attention anyway? 
If one of your kids is sick or a friend needs you, they call. If you have to fill up the tank of gas, you'll realize when you get in the car and it's on empty, like mine often is because my son borrows the car and never fills the car back up. Um, if you realize you've run out of milk, you'll realize it when you open up the fridge and you'll deal with it. But it's not really that important. It's not life or death. It's not a big thing. You need to pick the three things that are the actual priority. So lifestyle overwhelm, brain dump, highlight the three things that actually matter. And that's how you beat that lie that everything's important because when everything's important, nothing is, and you get to say what's important. So pick those things. All right. Our next question is from Cindy and Cindy's overwhelm comes from the fact that she says yes to everything. I can't wait for you to hear the lie she's telling herself because I think you're going to relate to this one too. Hi Mel, this is Cindy. Do you have a strategy for not overcommitting for daily tasks? It sounds so ridiculous when I type it out, but it really is destructive and sparks feelings of failure when I cannot accomplish all I believe I should be able to handle in a single day. Thanks so much. Oh, Cindy, I love you. Cindy, I relate to you too. You have a case of lifestyle overwhelm. You have perfectionism and you also put a ton of pressure on yourself. And there's this huge lie that we overachievers tell ourselves. You want to hear it? There's so much more I should be doing. Everybody's doing more than me. I should be doing more. I need to do more. Here's the truth. You need to do what needs to get done. And the rest does not matter. And so here is the rule that we're going to build upon. Imagine that you do the brain dump. Your problem is you highlight everything that you just dumped on a piece of paper. And so I'm going to give you this tool. It's called the rule of three. There are only three things that actually matter. And I often say to myself when I start getting a case of lifestyle overwhelm, when I'm trying to add things to the to-do list, when I'm putting pressure on myself to do more, when I feel weird that I'm like kind of done with what needed to get done and now I don't know what to do with myself so I feel like I should do more. Mel, it doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't matter. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. This happened to me last night. So last night I was scurrying around with a case of lifestyle overwhelm because I'm trying to get through my to-do list and I'm realizing, oh my God, I don't have any clean underwear for this freaking trip. So I've got to do laundry before I have to pack, which of course only makes me feel more overwhelmed. So I grab the basket of laundry. I tromp, tromp, tromp up the stairs. And as I'm climbing up the stairs to the second floor of our house here in Southern Vermont, I look up and all of the walls in the upstairs hallway are blank. They have a brand new coat of paint on them, but there ain't nothing hanging on these walls. And I immediately feel this wave of overwhelm come over me because I don't have any pictures of our family in our new house. And I've always envisioned that we will do a family picture wall on these three walls. And I start to think, oh my God, wait, are we going to do... Uh, pictures that are black and white with black frames or should we do those sort of blow up things that uh, wrap the canvas around the things that are sort of like an inch thing and they're colorful and do I do them different sizes or and I start to feel completely overwhelmed and then I start to beat myself up for the fact that I haven't done this that I don't have any pictures identified, that I also let my Shutterfly account go because they just moved to a whole thing where now you have to pay in order to have your pictures stored there. And I have all my old pictures on Shutterfly. And oh my, now I'm beating myself up about that. And so now here I am with a load of laundry. I have put the basket down. I didn't even realize I did. And I'm looking at all three walls having a panic attack about these freaking pictures and this project that doesn't fucking matter. Pick three things. Three things, Mel. The rule of three. The only thing that matters is getting this damn laundry done so that you have underwear to wear while you are delivering a eulogy. And you need to, I don't remember what the third thing was yesterday, but I think I got it done. It doesn't fucking matter, Mel. So don't get overwhelmed about what the third thing was yesterday. You know what the three things are today. You got to work on the eulogy. You got to pack for Boston. And what was the third thing? 
Oh, yeah, I got to pick up my medicine. Thank you, Amy. See, I don't even know. Lifestyle overwhelm. I have legitimate overwhelm, which means I know that the dial's cranked up right now. And so I also know I need to give myself a little bit of a break, that I am going to be in this state of feeling amped up until I get through this eulogy. That's just the legitimate overwhelm that I'm feeling. But I don't need to add on top of that a dose of lifestyle overwhelm by obsessing over a picture wall that I have not uh, done anything about in six months of living here. Six months. Okay. So that's it. That's it. Okay. And the same is true for you. Lower the pressure. Lower the pressure. And for those of us that have trouble sitting still or relaxing, you got to be really careful about lifestyle overwhelm because it will rob you of your ability to be present. It will rob you of just being able to sit down and read a book or go out into your garden and weed or pick up a phone and make a date to go meet a friend for coffee. And that's how this creeps into your whole life. This lie that you say that you got to be doing more. No, you don't. The whole point of this is to enjoy your life. And catching yourself when you get a case of lifestyle overwhelm and reminding yourself of the rule of three, that will help you lower the pressure, focus on what matters, and create more time to just chill and enjoy your life. Okay? So Casey, I am so glad you are here because, you know, I struggle with staying organized and not beating myself up over it. I pretty much have my shit together in so many areas of my life. Can you explain why it's so hard to just get the simple chores done around the house? So I think there's kind of four variables here. Okay. I think on a very basic level, um, there are emotional difficulties. Like we tend to moralize care tasks. You know, if we can't get the laundry done on time, if the dishes are in the sink, we tend to tell ourselves that that's about us failing. Mm. That's about us not being good enough. And that can really make it difficult to find motivation, to get on top of those tasks, to think of creative ways to help yourself. I think for some people, there's a physical aspect to it. You know, the disability is a very real variable in making some of those tasks difficult. And then, of course, usually you have the emotional on top of it, right? It's hard for me to do this, and therefore I must be failing. And then we have the mental aspect of it. I think that there's a lot of people when they're under stress, when they're in bereavement, when life is just hard, you know, we don't appreciate how complex our brain is when it does those little tasks and how our brain can go from doing things on autopilot to all of a sudden every step feels like you have to make yourself do it um and i think on top laying on top of all of that are just the societal messages that we have gotten about care tasks and about whose job it is to do those care tasks what does it mean about the value of that labor to get those care tasks done um you know who should be above doing those types of tasks and whose job is it to do those tasks. Um, and I, so I think you run into a long history societally of, you know, what do we think about domestic labor and about women and about um, people of color, people of color and, and how much should we have to pay for this kind of labor that we maybe don't see as valuable. Um, and so there's, there's, there's surprisingly quite a bit of racism and sexism involved in those societal messages. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, from my own personal experience, I just think about the fact that I grew up in a house where my dad worked out of the house and my mom was a stay-at-home mom for most of it, and she did everything around the house. And it got ingrained in me subconsciously that it's just my job. And mm -hmm. that if I'm not able to do that job on top of every other job, then something must be wrong with me. How does that piece, the subconscious piece of what was modeled for you and what society tells you and the fact that, let's just face it, most dudes are not doing the same amount of work. The division of labor in a household is proven by research to not be equal between uh, people who identify as male and people who identify as female. Well, it's that same modeling. They saw their mother do it all. 
and they saw their dad not do it. They saw the men, you know, get around the football game after Thanksgiving while the women went in the kitchen and cleaned the dishes. And so much of this domestic labor is invisible. You don't realize how much work has been done unless it's not done. Oh, that's so true. And I also think your point about morality, how does what you saw growing up or what society has sort of imprinted on all of us, how does that impact what you're talking about when there's moral weight to whether or not the dishes are done or the laundry is done or your house is clean or you got it all together? Well, you start to think, you know, my value, I think this especially happens for, for people who identify as women, my value is directly tied to my ability to pull this off. And even in, in, you know, I consider myself a very progressive woman, a very feminist woman. I don't think my value is how good I am at laundry. But then it becomes something even more insidious, which is I should be able to have this career and not let my house fall to shit. That's what the that's what boss ladies do. And and, <laughs> and if I can't do that, you know, then I feel as though I'm failing. And then those old societal things that I didn't even think I believed about, well, if people come over, they're going to judge me for this house not being clean. I could not agree more. I am just like you in feeling like, okay, I'm a feminist, but and I'm a girl or and I'm a badass boss lady and I can do it all. But as I'm standing in the laundry room and I see what is almost always a parade of piles on the floor and I'm lucky enough that I've got a little room with a machine in it, I can do my laundry. I look at these piles on the floor. I look at the crisp white towels that I once bought at Target. And I say to myself, why are they blue? Mm. Why did somebody have to wash them with a pair of jeans? Why can't I stay on top of this? And I feel this level of overwhelm and failure that I don't want to feel. And so, and this is universal. Like I, I was so blown away by the number of people that poured into the DMs and the comments that listened to this show that are overwhelmed by the simplest tasks of keeping up with your stuff at home and taking care of yourself. And so aside from the bigger messaging, which I agree with you, how does that impact why it's so hard? And here we are 2023 where we're not only supposed to be on top of all the housework but most of us are also supposed to have jobs and have ambitions and be a girl boss and do all these things and it's it's just frankly too much for one person to handle but mm. because of those societal messages coming to a head we have we have looked at care tasks as moral obligations that this is the sign of whether or not i'm a valid adult I'm a good mother, I'm a competent spouse, I have my stuff together, and we equate having our shit together with being a worthwhile human being, being deserving of love. You're right. I just thought I was disorganized. This is a crisis of how I am actually <laughs> showing up as a human being when I stare at these piles. It goes so much deeper which is why what I read over and over and over again in the DMs is this level of heaviness around doing household chores and taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So let's keep going even deeper. You talked about the fact that chores and other actions around your house, doing the dishes, keeping it tidy, cleaning the bathroom, taking out the trash, that these are morally neutral? What the hell does that mean? So most of us, you know, like you said, we look at the laundry, we walk by the dishes, and there's this message we give ourselves of, I'm really screwing up. I'm a failure. Like, worst case, I'm a failure. I don't deserve love. Best case, oh, Casey, get it together. Ugh. I, uh, there's this this constant frustration and we feel as though they are truly reflections of our character as a person and and the biggest message that i have for people is that it is a morally neutral task mess is morally neutral dishes do not make meaning only people do 
and we are assigning that meaning that's coming from our head maybe it's our voice maybe it's someone in our lives voice that's kind of internalized but we're the one walking by the dishes and going look at what a failure i am it's true but i still don't quite get it because to me <laughs> When I see piles of dishes everywhere, when I see parades of laundry, when I can't get out of bed and on those mornings where I don't want to make my bed or I see the trash piling over or like this morning, this morning I went to make a cup of coffee and the milk was that kind of the, the, the state of the milk in the carton was, you know, when you pick up a carton of milk and it's got maybe an inch and mm -hmm. you kind of shake it and you're like, uh oh. <laughs> uh, is that like, is this going to be okay? And then you screw off the top and take a whiff and you're like, what? this just turned. So I can't even get it together to get to the store to get a gallon of milk so that I can have my coffee here. And then I stand there and I'm like, just what you said, Mel, what the hell? You can't even like get the fridge stocked. You can't keep milk in place for yourself so you can have a cup of coffee for crying out loud yeah what is wrong with you yeah so the, so the meaning you mean, though, that you made about that because but isn't that true like isn't there something wrong with the fact that i can't keep the fridge stocked and i can't keep on top of the laundry like aren't i doing something wrong well that's the meaning that you made of it but let me ask you this mel like what else could it mean what else oh. could that pile of laundry mean it could mean that we've had non-stop visitors for the last 10 days. And um, there are people use a lot of towels. That's what that means. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of like a neutral neutral thing, right? Like, oh, we had visitors. That's certainly morally neutral. Did, let me tell you, what did you do with those visitors while they were here? Um, we hung out. We had a great time. We swam in the pond. We uh, watched the sunset. We ate great meals. We played cribbage. We went out to dinner. It was awesome. So you were you exercised hospitality. You prioritized those relationships while they were in your home. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that laundry means something good about you. Oh, I love you already. This is good. Right? Like you prioritize something that I think if we were all just to look at the objectively is more important than than the laundry that day or however many days. Now, don't get me wrong. You still deserve clean clothes. So I'm not saying laundry doesn't matter. But it sounds like that mess in your home actually means really good things about you. It's true. So if somebody that's listening is like, well, I had no visitors and it's just piled up like the kids soccer stuff is piled up or my roommates pile of laundry is in front of my pile of laundry or it's like now at the end of my bed because the uh, laundromat is down the street. How would you flip that for somebody listening? Well, it helps to think what would I say to a friend sometimes mm. in this case? Because what if what it means about you is that you're having a hard time? But don't don't people who are having a hard time deserve compassion? And aren't you also people? Like, does it have to mean it doesn't have we don't have it's not toxic positivity it doesn't have to mean something great about you, although sometimes it does. Maybe right. it just means you're having a hard week. What what immediately occurred to me, Casey, is that I think it's easier for many of us to say you're a piece of shit or you can't deal than to drop deeper and be honest with yourself and admit that the pile of laundry at the end of your bed means you're just having a hard time. It's overwhelming at work. You've been fighting with your significant other. You are feeling a little lost. And that's what that pile of laundry represents, which is why it feels kind of scary on some level that it's gotten to this. Does and that it's make not, sense? It's not an indictment, though. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't want to recognize that I'm having a hard time so that I can then feel bad about myself. Because we get into this rat race of self-improvement where my worthiness is tied to how self-improved I am. <laughs> like I must optimize my mental health and my emotional health and my physical health and my nutrition and my, my gut health, like at all times, right? And the truth is, is that 
the reason we pursue those things is because it it increases our quality of life. It's mm -hmm. not a I'm more lovable when I'm on top of the laundry. I'm more lovable when I'm doing self care. I'm like. For so many of us, self-care just becomes another thing that we can't get to, that we don't have the time for, that we don't have the energy for. And now we feel bad. Great. And I can't even take care of myself right. What a piece of shit right. I am. Right. No, it's so true. And so how do you want all of us, and especially you listening to this conversation, to think about self-care? Brushing your teeth, washing your face resting, eating okay, being kind to yourself. How do you want us to think about self-care? Because you're right. So many of us, I know, I feel like I put my business first. I put my kids first. I put the dogs first. I put my husband first. I put everybody that works for me first. And I often don't do the things for me that I know that I need. And then I make myself wrong for not taking care of myself. Yeah. So how do you want us to think about taking care of ourselves? Well, I want us to bring it, it down to the very basics, like away from bubble baths and pedicures and yoga and things like, <laughs> and to the very basics of laundry, dishes, you know, a, a clear space to walk. Not that those things are a measured measure of whether you're failing or not, because yep. like we like we established, there will be days where the laundry means oh, I must be having a hard time. And there'll be days when laundry means I'm nailing it today. I'm actually prioritizing all the things that need to prioritize. So that's what we mean when we say the laundry itself, morally neutral. It could give you some information, but it's it's morally neutral. There's nothing wrong with laundry. I, I would not be able to know whether you were feeling good or bad by looking at your laundry. So, but self-care at its core is about doing a task that cares for self. And we've gotten to a place where we see the dishes and the laundry, not only in service for other people, mm. like my job is just to do those things for the people in my home, but also as this external measurement for whether I'm measure measuring up, as opposed to looking at the laundry and going, okay, it's been a busy week. I had friends. I loved that. I prioritized the right things. And I deserve clean clothes. And I deserve clean dishes to eat off of. And my kids deserve a clean place to play. And the beauty of that is that that does not require that you do all of your laundry or all of your dishes or have a perfectly clean playroom. What does it mean? We want to get away from, is it clean enough? Is it perfect? Will better homes and gardens come take a picture of this? Will my mother-in-law judge me? And just, is it functional? Because sometimes I'm in a place where there's a lot going on, good, bad, stressful, happy, and I can see I'm not going to have clean clothes if I don't do some laundry. And I can make the choice, okay, for the next two hours, I'm going to do all the laundry. Or I can make the choice, you know what, I'm going to wash and dry one outfit because I don't have the capacity to do anything else right now, but I do deserve clean clothes tomorrow. Or mm -hmm. I can go, you know what? I, I am uh, privileged enough to have the budget to ship this shit out this week. And there's nothing moral about that decision. I, that's what I should do, because I hate doing laundry. And, I, and I'm in a position finally at the age of 54 and working my tail off that I could probably drop things off at a laundromat and have somebody else do it. You wrote in your book that your space should serve you. Mm. What do you mean? So I think for a lot of us, you know, we look at those dishes and we look at the laundry, we feel so overwhelmed and we react in one of two ways is that we either feel paralyzed at how much there is and do nothing and it builds up and builds up and builds up or we go into that activated state and we just go, 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 go. And we don't allow ourselves to sit. We don't allow ourselves to rest. We don't allow ourselves to do anything less than perfect. And because of those two things, um, we, we have a lot of people that are kind of running around like a chicken with their head cut off, kind of pinballing about their house, trying to get things done. And there's this exhaustion of it, it's not good enough. And that's a reflection on me and how well I'm doing. And what I like to say is you do not exist to serve your house. Your house exists to serve you. 
So yes, that's going to take some maintenance from us, but it's your, it's your house's job to serve you, not your job to serve a house. What do you do if you're someone like me that truly prefers a house that is pulled together? Like my brain, when the counters are clear and the shoes are in the cubbies and the pillows have a karate chop, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I can feel my brain go, oh. so a house that serves me best is the one that really does look pulled together. And yet there are times where I can't seem to pull it together. And maybe Casey, it's because for my family, chores and picking up seem to be morally neutral. They don't seem to be bothered by the mess. I'm the one that is like a, like bothered by it because they walk right by the dog poop or the pile of laundry or the dead flowers in the vase or the say you know the, the, the stuff in that not my husband so much. Chris is pretty awesome, but the kids absolutely. What do you do if you want your space to be calm and to be kind of clutter free? Because that's what does serve you on the rare occasions that it happens. So there's a lot of ways to address that. And the first one I always like to say is I love to get curious with people about why that is relaxing to them. Because there is a difference between I feel more at ease when my space is functional and and when things are beautiful i like to look at beautiful things mm. versus when my house is put together right i feel like i'm doing okay i can breathe i feel mm. like i've got it I've, I've got myself together and therefore i am worthy so what you tell yourself when your house is clean will mirror what you tell yourself when your house is messy because if you look around at your house put together and go okay see see I, I'm a real adult, I've got it together, I, I'm on top of things, then when you have a, a week when it's messy, well, what must that mean? So I like to kind of differentiate that there's a difference between a functional enjoyment of your space. I like to know where my things are and get them. I mm. like to be to you know walk into my kitchen and see a beautiful vase of flowers. I like to not smell dog shit on the floor, right? Like those are functional <laughs> enjoyments of your space. That's different than I, I, I can't rest unless it's perfect, but because it doesn't actually serve you. If perfect makes you not have anxiety, that doesn't necessarily mean perfect does, perfect serves you. Well, then let's go there because as I was listening to you, I would divide, at least for me, my house into two um, spots, public and private. And so in the public spaces, because I work from home like so many of us do, and there's a lot of people coming in and out. Um, and a lot of people have busy households with kids and that kind of stuff. I just find that I love beauty. Mm -hmm. I love the flowers. I love the home being like, like a warm hug for people to walk into. Just in a few rooms. And I don't feel this moral obligation. It's just that I just feel an exhale. And I don't feel like there's anything that I need to do, and maybe we're going to go psychological now, to prepare anything for anybody to make them feel welcome and like things are waiting. Yeah. In the private spaces, though, I beat myself up. Mm. Like the laundry room, the bathrooms, the uh, my closet. My closet uh, has a, you know, a stool in it where I currently have a Tetris game going with dirty laundry. Um uh, my favorite cleaning method is to close the door and then feel bad about it, that there's a pile in there that's still waiting for me. Like there is that, I'm, I, I, there, I'm, I'm, it's not that I want a beautiful closet. I feel like I can't get to the shit and there's something wrong with me. Well, it's important to remember that care tasks are not binary states of done or not done. They are cycles. What does that mean? So what that means is that we're used to going, are the dishes done or are they not done? Is the laundry oh. done or is it not done? But in, in true. true, 
your laundry exists in a cycle. You have it does. clothes that are clean in the closet. You have clothes that are on your body. You have clothes that are dirty on the floor. You have clothes that are dirty in the hamper. You have clothes that are dirty waiting to go in the wash. You have some in the wash. You have some there. You have some that are waiting. Like that's a cycle. And every state of that cycle, Mel, is morally neutral. You're not a good person when it, they're all parked in the, you know, closet and a bad person when they're in the hamper. It's okay for any of it to be in that cycle. And you are not morally obligated to line up every care cycle in your home at the done state at the same time. If you could see me right now, as you're listening to this podcast, you on YouTube, come on. my mouth is on the floor because KC Davis, you just changed my fucking life with that reframe. Let me just give it back to you because I want you listening to really grab a hold of this. First of all, if you think about laundry, the machine has cycles that you can pick from. And laundry, if you think about it like a never ending cycle, just a never ending cycle of things that go in the washer, things that go in the dryer, things that go back to the spots where they're going to go, then they go back in the washer, then they go back in the dryer. It's never a thing that gets done. It's always a cycle. The same thing is true with grocery shopping. Mm -hmm. You don't get grocery shopping done. You do it in a cycle. The same, same thing, thing is true is as tidying. I mean, you, uh, my, my playroom, my living room, it's not clean or dirty. It's clean, perfect, just cleaned it. It's a few toys on the floor. It's a few toys and a few more on the floor. It's, and, and here's the key. In that cycle, there's a place where it reaches where it's not functional anymore. And that's where mm. I want to reset the cycle. Okay. But the, the key isn't how do I get everything done and keep it done and keep on top of it. The key is how do I learn to turn all of these cycles at a pace where it's functional, where I, can't, where I have clean clothes when I need them, clean dishes when I need them. I always say like when I decided to take on the laundry of my home, I signed up to make sure that my family always has clean clothes. I did not sign up to make sure they never have dirty ones. Oh, say that again. Same with the dishes. Louder for the people in the back, Casey. Say that again. I signed up to make sure that my family always has clean dishes to eat off of. I did not sign up to make sure they never have dirty ones. And for the laundry, I signed up to make sure I have clean clothes and so do my families. I never signed up to make sure that there were never dirty clothes. Oh, and you, and my you get to God. customize that cycle because if you're moving that cycle too fast, Mel, you're exhausted, you're perfectionistic, you're anxious, you can't sit down, you can't rest. Or if you're struggling in such a way where you're not moving those cycles fast enough, you don't have clean clothes, you, you can't function in your space. Think, so you just wanna get a pace that works for you and you can customize those cycles. I don't fold my clothes because that was the part that was stuck sticking the cycle. How so? So like why, what did you figure out about yourself? Because it's interesting that you say that Casey, because I could load a dishwasher full of dirty dishes all day long. I could load a washing machine and I love stain sticking that stuff and shoving it in there and like all the things I, and, and I can even move it to the dryer. When the dryer beeps or the dishwasher is done, I have some kind of a trauma response to that because I hate putting things away. Hate it. Yeah. It sucks. Yes. Can I make a guess on why? Bring it on. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what it is for me and we'll see what it is for you. The act of loading things, my brain naturally will do it in a pattern, right? Like yes. if I'm loading up the dishwasher, it's like cups, 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 <laughs> plates, 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 plates. And I'm putting it all in in this beautiful Tetris whatever, right? Same with laundry. It's going in, it's going in, it's going in, it's going in. And I'm dump, 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 shut. It's this pattern. But when you have to put dishes away, it's pick up. Look at it. Cup. Fucking cup goes over here. This is a, okay, this is a, <laughs> like, there's the bending. Nobody likes to bend over and over. And there's no pattern. Like, your brain likes patterns. It gets a little dopamine juice from it. Oh, my God. I even, when I, when I have to unload it, I avoid it like the plague. You know, I'm, I'm joking about the dog poop, but it's typically a cat hairball. Somehow our cat will barf these hairballs up and everybody walks by it like they didn't see it. <laughs> and I know they saw it. 
because they come to me and go, mom, the cat threw up. I'm like, and pick it up. He's your cat too. I digress. But when we, when I, on the occasions that I unload the dishwasher, I always organize them into groups on the counter Mm -hmm. because I, you're right. It's the patterning of it. I fucking love you. That's one of the hacks is turning things into patterns, turning things into rituals. So here's what happened to me with my laundry. I I could get it in the washer. I could get it in the dryer. And then what I would do is I would pull it out and it would sit in a pile, a clean pile in front of the dryer. Same. And I would do this over and over and over. And I would, everyone would walk over it. And when I wanted to dress me and my kids in the morning, I'd have to, you know, go through the pile and find something clean to wear. And I was always kind of stressed about it. And there's like this one, I did it for eight months after my last baby. And there was this one day where I actually like they miraculously were asleep at the same time. And I was like, I'm going to go fold that laundry. And I'm sitting there and I'm folding the laundry. And I'm just thinking about how much it sucks and how much I hate folding laundry. And, And I look down at myself all of a sudden and I'm folding like a fleece pajama onesie. Mm -hmm. And I was, I like slowed down and I like put it down and I looked around and I was like, I had folded like underwear and like running shorts and tank tops that I never wear outside of the house. And I was like, none of this shit needs to be folded. Like, why am I folding fleece pajamas and baby onesies that either don't wrinkle or like nobody gives a shit if they're wrinkled. Like there were there when I really started to look around and think about it, there was such a small percentage of my wardrobe that needed to be folded or hung up. And I hate folding. So I just started hanging it up. So I have, you know, maybe 12 shirts that need to hang. Sure. But everything else, what I did that day was I, first of all, I took all the clothes out of my kids' closets because I realized it was so stupid for me to be dressing three people and moving to three different locations to do that. I was like, this is silly. I need to look at my, you know, my main ensuite um, closet, which was big and it was off the laundry room. And I just moved everyone's clothes in there. So I could go to one place with my small children, undress everyone. So now all the dirty clothes are in one place, dress everyone because our clothes are there. And I stopped folding them. I just got a bunch of baskets and I organized them. So then when stuff comes out of the dryer, I literally sit on my butt and and it's like it's like I'm throwing cards. Like I just it's like shorts, shorts, pants, shirts. <laughs> like I just put them and they're all organized. And are they wrinkled? Yes, but you know what? They were wrinkled before, but now they're organized and no one's walking over them and I'm not stressed and I can find what I'm looking for. So by cutting out that step that didn't doesn't actually bring value to me. It was just a thing I thought I was supposed to be doing. Mm. All of a sudden, that was it. That was the hitch in the cycle that was like grinding the gear every time it got to that place. And now the laundry's done every week. Wow. See, you're better than me. <laughs> I just get I'm it. not better than you. No, it's point. morally There's neutral. No better. You just there found a no system. Better. Let's just start with your concept that when it comes to getting things done, momentum is way more important than motivation. So research shows us that momentum builds once we start going. So in a lot of ways, we sit around waiting for motivation to do something, when in reality, sometimes motivation precedes the action. Like you do something and then you feel that motivation. And the problem with motivation is twofold. You know, we talked last time about how if you're looking at your laundry and going, I don't want to do that. I don't understand why it's important. I don't care. I don't deserve clean laundry. That's a motivation problem. But if you're going, I wish I could get that laundry done, but I just feel frozen to my seat. That's a task initiation problem. And that's when you really want to focus on building momentum. Well, what do you want us to do instead? One of the things I like to say is that we can use 5% momentum to do 5% of the task instead of just waiting around for 100% momentum to do everything. And so thinking to yourself, you know, I don't have to do all the laundry, but I can fold one thing. I don't have to do all the dishes, but I can do two dishes. I can set a timer for five minutes and clean for five minutes. That makes perfect sense. But sometimes something that makes sense isn't so easily applied when you feel like shit. And so I want to dig into our listener questions so you can unpack this further, Casey, because I keep getting DMs and forms submitted at melrobbins.com slash podcast where people are writing in feeling overwhelmed and they're making themselves wrong for not feeling motivated. They're looking for motivation. For example, here are two questions from listeners who have recently written in. Here's the first one. Mel, I'm having that moment where I'm so overwhelmed. I can't get to anything. I've been laid off. 
and it's been a couple of weeks, zero motivation. Or this one from another listener. After a bad re-breakup with my high school sweetheart of several years, I have lost all motivation to clean the house or take care of myself. Casey, what do you hear in these questions? I hear a couple of things. There's a difference between motivation and task initiation. So motivation is the awareness and, and the belief that an, a thing is worth doing and that you would like to do it or you would at least like the results of it. So if you're looking at your laundry and you're going, what's the point? I don't even deserve clean clothes. That's motivation issues. Mm. Or if you're looking at your laundry and going, I don't care. I don't, I don't care about it. Like I literally, like it literally doesn't bother me to wear dirty clothes. That's a motivation issue. And it's maybe, maybe you could just wear, I mean, like, who cares? I'm not your judge, right? If you're going, I am so, so frozen. I can't, I can't do it. I'm looking at my laundry going, I should do that. I've got to do that. I wish that was done. That's not motivation. What I hear is these people thinking to themselves, I'm not doing anything anymore. And what I'm hearing is they are doing something. They are processing emotionally a significant crisis in their life. And that takes emotional resources and that takes cognitive resources. And you are not going to have enough resources sometimes to deal with that crisis and do your laundry. Like that is normal and human. It would be weird. You don't have an unlimited amount of cognitive resources every day. And if you are using a good portion of those processing pain, caring for a child, processing a breakup, being in emotional pain, re-experiencing trauma, being terrified about how you're gonna pay your bills. You are going to use up a lot of your cognitive emotional resources and those executive functioning tools, and you are going to struggle to do these other things. One of the things that I love saying to anybody and to myself when that happens in life and you feel paralyzed or profoundly overwhelmed or you're in a breakdown is the pile of laundry and the breakdown and the paralysis is a sign that you're mentally well. Yeah, like because that's your how body you're is to processing do it. it. Yeah, you yeah. know, your body, you can't, of course you are breaking down. Of course, after a major breakup or getting laid off or losing somebody that you love, of course you're going to go through a period of time where you just don't have the energy. I think the problem becomes and I th when that's your everyday life, where it's chronic. When and it's not functional. Yes, when it's not functional. Because you realize you would like to get to this stuff, but you can't even get to the beginning of the task. You're that depleted. Yeah. And, and when that happens, what do you recommend people do? So that's when we want to look first, we want to go into self-compassion immediately because we know from studies, shame is arresting, self-compassion is motivating. We see greater psychological functioning with people that can exercise self-compassion. So we get in that place where we're feeling frozen, we can't get things done. We want to first address, how am I speaking to myself about this? Am I saying I'm not doing anything? Well, is that true? It's not. I am doing something right now. I'm doing something very important. I'm listening to my body. I'm processing pain. I am being tender with myself. I am giving myself reasonable expectations. And you still deserve clean clothes. So that's when we want to look at some of these little life hacks. That's when we want to look at good enough is perfect because the options aren't lay in bed all day or get up and do all of your laundry. What if the option was lay in bed for 10 hours today and then get up and launder one outfit? I love what you just said. So I want to take my little yellow highlighter and make sure that you listening heard exactly what Casey just said, because this is an important distinction. Shame causes paralysis. When you start to make yourself wrong and you feel paralyzed, you are likely in shame. Self-compassion, I'm allowed to be human. I'm doing exactly what I need to, which is processing all this emotion. A little bit later, maybe I can wash one outfit or I can throw some water on my face. But right now, 
I'm just going to give myself the rest that I need because I deserve to process this. That is a life-changing distinction. And you now know kind of the emotional feel of both. One is paralysis, that's shame, and that's the beat down. And we want you to get out of that cycle. Right now, I'm sitting in a hotel room in Salt Lake City. I've got about an hour before I've got to cross the street and head over to the convention center and give a speech. But something happened this morning where I caught myself going down a rabbit hole. I started worrying about something. Then the worries became even bigger. And I realized I'm doing that thing. I'm doing that thing where I am causing myself a lot of pain because I am catastrophizing. So many of us struggle with this. You may struggle with this, where your mind is constantly defaulting to what's going to go wrong or you're always dwelling on problems that haven't happened yet. And so I thought, why don't I just jump on the mic while I have a little bit of time here and explain what just happened to me because I know you're going to relate to it. So here's the deal. So I wake up and I roll out of bed and I start my normal morning routine and I pick up my phone. And one of the reasons why I picked up my phone is because our oldest child, our daughter Sawyer, who's 24 years old, is in the middle of a solo backpacking trip on the other side of the world. And this is something she's wanted to do for a long time. It's really well planned out. And of course, because I'm her mother, <laughs> because I worry, I am tracking her location. And we're all on WhatsApp. We're in a family group text. And right now she is in Australia and she had planned as part of her itinerary that she was going to go on a couple solo hikes. <laughs> Cue the worry. Okay. I got my 24 year old daughter backpack on her back in a country she's never been to. Obviously, it's relatively safe, but that does not uh, prevent me from coming up with all kinds of fantasies in my mind about what could go wrong. And so I've been pretty good. I've been really good. You know, I, I have been able to just enjoy from afar and not become a stalker, but something happened that caused me to spiral this morning. She summited this mountain in Australia to see a sunrise two days ago. And I haven't heard from her. And I go to track her location. And I'm like, where is she? And it's sort of rainbow wheeling. So I can't quite see where she is. And I know she's okay. Because she posted something on social media. But I woke up this morning. And I immediately looked at my WhatsApp. There was no message from her in the family group chat. There was no message her, from her directly to me. I then went to Instagram. I looked in the DMs. There was no DM from her. And I started to panic. And what did my mind think? I'm almost embarrassed to tell you. Why don't you just step in my shoes for a minute? What do you think Mel Robbins was thinking, knowing that her daughter had summited a mountain alone? It's like a five-mile hike up. She started at 4 o'clock in the morning to see the sunrise. We saw the photos of the sunrise. Haven't heard from her since. What do you think my mind is thinking right now? It's been 48 hours. She's on the other side of the world. Oh, you know. I'm not thinking, oh, I bet she met some friends and she's out having fun. Or maybe her phone died. Or you know what, Mel? Maybe she's so busy that she doesn't have time to talk to you. Because the whole point of her trip is not to keep you posted of her whereabouts. It's for her to go out and have this incredible experience and to grow and to discover and to be brave and to explore. That's not what my mind thought. Nope. You know what my mind thought? She's dead. She fell off the mountain after taking the... Uh, sunrise photo, the woman is dead. Then I thought, no, 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 maybe she got kidnapped. Then I thought, oh, no, she was sexually assaulted on the side of the trail. And somebody, I, I, this is disgusting, I know, but do not tell me that you don't do the same thing. That your mind goes dark. I'm talking gruesome, scary horror movie, dark, like in a nanosecond. And here's the thing. I know that this is a terrible thing to do. I know that this causes me pain. And I bet you do it too. I know you do, in fact, because I've seen the DMs that you write to me, whether it's you are worried about your money and you're constantly worried about something bad happening with your money or getting fired or forgetting about something for your kids. And that's where your brain is constantly settling. And here's what we're going to do today. 
because we're all guilty of this. There is so much research around the fact that worry is so painful in your life. Worry is a habit. This is a really, really bad spiral to get into. It causes you a lot of pain. It causes you a lot of stress. It can certainly bring on anxiety. And if you already struggle with a little bit of anxiety, it can make it a lot worse. It doesn't help with your confidence. And one out of three people, according to research, struggle with constant worrying. And so what I want to share with you today is a six-word sentence that I use all the time in these moments when I catch my mind spiraling. And it really helps. And it really helps me because it stops that freight train of bad and negative and catastrophic thoughts. And here's the six words. You ready? This is what I say to myself. What if it all works out? So as I'm standing this morning in my underwear, I don't even have a bra on this morning, and I've already visualized my daughter uh, falling to her death off of a cliff in the middle of nowhere in Australia. <laughs> I'm brushing my teeth, and I'm starting to notice my anxiety rising. It's 6.15 in the morning here, and I have inflicted self-torture on myself before I've had a glass of water or a cup of coffee. This is completely unnecessary. And I catch myself. And this is what I want to teach you to do. Because you need to start catching yourself. I think you and I can agree that we can't control anything that's happening outside of us, right? But we can certainly control our reaction to it. And so I'm standing there in my underwear. I'm visualizing my daughter's death or the fact that she's been kidnapped and abducted. And I notice the stress rise and I say to myself, Mel, what if it all works out? What if it all works out? I mean, you can't argue with that, right? What if it all works out? Because in this moment where you're worried about getting fired or you're worried about forgetting something for your kids or you're worried about what will happen if the people that you love the most are going to die before you can say goodbye. Or this one happens for me a lot. I'll be sitting on a plane and it's taking off and I suddenly spiral and think, if this plane crashes, I, 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 I'm not going to see my daughter's wedding. I'm not going to meet my grandkids. I'm not going to get to do all this stuff that I really want to do in my life. And in that moment where I'm in the negative, what if this, what if that, what if the other thing? And I feel the pain rising and I feel the stress rising and I feel the self-inflicted torture coming on, I simply drop in those six words. What if it all works out? And here's what happens. It stops the spiral. That's the first thing that happens. What if it all works out? You just hit the brakes on the locomotive of worry. The second thing that happens is because it's a question, what if it all works out? you actually pause for a second and consider it. And what you realize when you stop for a second and you pause and you consider, what if it all works out? Is you don't actually know what's going to happen, do you? You're just choosing to make yourself believe that something terrible has already happened. But the truth is, in this moment, you don't know. And so it is a fact a logical fact that it could all work out. And in fact, based on the research, this is kind of amazing. I want to, I want to throw some research at you. Um, let me find this. You can hear me flipping through my papers because there's a lot of really interesting stuff. There is a study at Penn State where they looked at chronic worrying. And the average person has three to four major worries a day. Okay. What if I get fired? What if I'm not happy? What if my marriage ends? Will I find love and have children? What if I don't make the money? What if this? What if that? What if the other thing? All these worries that every single one of us, you and me, we have at least three or four of them that cause us stress or make us feel some level of pain. According to this Penn State study, 91% of those worries are completely false. It's self-inflicted torture. And I think you and I both know that. And here's the other really kind of interesting thing. You know, the other 9% of the worries that do happen, the outcome is almost always way better than you expected. 
period. Okay. The outcome is way better than you expected about a third of the time. Uh, so what does this mean? This means that you going, what if it's a disaster? What if this happens? What if she's fallen off a cliff? What if I never hear from her again? What if she doesn't? Bah, 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 bah. What if it all works out? See, you don't know, do you? You don't know if you're getting fired. You don't know if you're going to run out of money. But you can rely on the research that 91% of the time it doesn't happen and a third of the 9% of the remaining, it's way better than you thought. And that leaves you with a 6% chance that something might happen. And here's how I look at this. If something bad happens, I will deal with it then. Why do I need to torture myself now? when I don't even know if something amazing is happening or something bad is happening. And so what if it all works out is a way for you to catch yourself because you and I inflict so much pain and it is pain. It's pain when you do this to yourself. It was painful to stand in the bathroom here in Salt Lake in my underwear brushing my teeth thinking about my daughter's death. And it's completely ridiculous. It's, it's not like, give me a break, Mel. Give me a freaking break. And I know all our fans right now in Australia and New Zealand are like, oh, she's fine. Like that, 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 that is ridiculous, Mel. It is, it is so fabulous. People do this all the time. They hike that trail. It's wide. It's this. It's that. I know the mountain you're talking about because she went up for the sunrise. You're completely ridiculous. That's why you need this six-word sentence. What if it all works out? Because it will interrupt the spiral. So Leela is up next, and I love this because she listened to the episode we recently did that you guys loved. Holy cow, it was one of the most shared episodes on Spotify. I'm so glad you got a lot out of it. And a lot of you responded to the fact that I connected your habit of procrastinating to the fight or flight response that we have when we get stressed out. You know how when you get stressed, you have that fight, flight, or freeze. Procrastination is a form of freezing. And so that episode is procrastination, the only way to stop procrastination based on research. Again, we will link to it in the show notes. And Leela had a follow-up question on that, and here it is. Mel, this is a huge thank you. I'm an artist, and also I procrastinate, and I get stressed, freeze, and then end up doing nothing. I heard what you said on the procrastination episode, and I think wearing the stress backpack is super heavy right now, and I plan to shed it today. I need to manage my time better. So now I need to figure out how to get back to my easel and start painting. I can't wait for your next episode. Thanks so much, Leela. Hey, it's Mel. And I just want to talk to you since you're watching this on YouTube. First of all, thank you for being a fan of the Mel Robbins podcast. You have made us one of the top ranking podcasts in the entire world. Um, please make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel because... It's your support that allows our team to bring this to you at zero cost. And so that's really important. And I don't want you watching this on YouTube while you're driving a car. Will you take me with you um, by subscribing to the Mel Robbins podcast on your favorite podcast platform, Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, Stitcher. You can listen on Audible. Anywhere that you listen to podcasts, please subscribe to The Mel Robbins Show. It really matters for a growing show like ours and allows us to continue to bring you all this great stuff at zero cost. Okay, let's go back to the show. Leela, I'm so happy you're on our walk today with me and that you shared that because procrastination is a form of lifestyle overwhelm. And in case you haven't listened to that episode yet, as you're taking this walk with us, when Leela said stress backpack, she's using a term that I used in that episode to basically say all those things that are going on in your life, the things that are causing you stress, whether it's conscious or subconscious, you literally carry it around with you as if all that stress is in a backpack. Joni, my friend who was caring for her mom, backpack of stress. Everybody that you've heard on our walk today, the demands of their life, the pressure that they're putting on themselves, all of that is a stress backpack. And you have one too. And what happens when you feel really stressed out is you can start to freeze. And then what happens when you freeze and you push things off and you procrastinate, you get stuck in lifestyle overwhelm. 
you're in this vicious cycle of pushing things off and then beating yourself up and then feeling overwhelmed because you're pushing things off that you really want to get to. And so what is the tool here? Because there's a huge lie that you tell yourself when you procrastinate, okay? And I can hear it. And the lie that we tell ourselves is I can handle this all in my head. That if I think about it, I'm working on it. Not true. Not true. It's one of the reasons why I use that tool of a brain dump all the time to get it out of my head, to not manage it in my head. Because if it spins in my head, it turns into rumination and nothing gets done. Just like those blank walls, those pictures are not getting done by me spinning thoughts about it. And so the real thing I want you to understand is that if it truly matters, you have to schedule it. Things that matter end up in your calendar. And so one tool that I want you to use, Leela, is ask yourself this. This is a journaling prompt that you can use, everybody, that I just love. How can I make this easy? How can I make this easy? What's the simplest way that you can make it easier to paint? And for me, I'm going to share with you. I have to do the things that are important first thing in the morning. It's not that I'm not an evening person. It's that by the end of the day, I am so wiped out and just gassed. I don't have the stamina or the willpower or the energy to force myself to do things that require energy. Um, you know, David Goggins, who I just love, he has his alter ego, Goggins. Goggins pushes himself and has the mental discipline. And I freaking love that. But I don't want to set up my life so that every night I've saved the thing that really brings me joy, I have to like summon up what, what, what researchers call, and we've talked about this in other episodes, it's called activation energy. Chick Me Sent Me High, who's a famous psychologist from the University, University of Chicago, studied uh, motivation and flow states extensively and realized that this resistance that we feel to doing things that we've put off that requires activation energy and getting out of bed, pushing yourself to paint. For me, it's exercise. And if I put off exercise till the evening, it's not happening. It takes me a hundred times more energy to drag my ass to that Peloton treadmill at night than it does to drag my ass to that Peloton treadmill in the morning. And so ask yourself, how can I make this easy? Maybe you need to do it at night. Maybe that is easier for you. Maybe you need to do it in the morning. Maybe it's the weekend. Or maybe you need to, if you can afford it, you need the structure of a painting class. One of the ways that I jump started exercising, and I realize not everybody can afford this, but one of the ways I jump started exercising was to start taking classes again because I would pay for it and then I was motivated to go and I knew once I got there, I could outsource the motivation to the instructor that would be yelling at me. Maybe you need a friend to do this with you, or you need somebody that's going to be your accountability partner and be really annoying on Saturday morning and text you and be like, hey, did you paint yet? I'm not meeting you for a walk until you did. And you can trade that kind of thing. Like I think a lot of you know, for example, that I uh, do a lot of the ice baths, you know, where you climb into a really cold barrel of water. Uh, or you jump into an icy pond or a river up here in Vermont, or you take a cold shower. Do you know how I make it easy? I do it with Chris, my husband. Chris is like living with a monk. The dude is so stoic. He just kind of climbs right in there. No big deal. He shames me into doing it. That's how I make it easier. He goes in first. Now I'm like, oh God, now I got to do it. But if I have to do it myself, it's hard. And so that's what I want you to understand. Procrastination creates overwhelm and chronic procrastination creates a vicious cycle that becomes lifestyle overwhelm. And so understand that, and that's huge that you understand that. And then the second thing I want you to do is remember, get it out of your head. Don't manage it there. It's got to get scheduled in real time. And then ask yourself, how can I make this easy? Because you can't. And there's no reason why the things that you need to do have to feel so hard. And the reason why they feel so hard, everybody, is because we're not taking the time to go, okay, first of all, am I in a lifestyle overwhelm situation 
where I need to be kinder to myself and I need to have more compassion for myself and I need to keep reminding myself that this is a marathon and I need a little bit of stamina and I'm not going to be able to get to everything. I remember when I was doing the talk show, I had this experience where um, my whole, most of my team came from Oprah Winfrey's uh, talk show and from her organization. And so I was surrounded by all these people that were super, super experienced. And my executive producer arranged for me to uh, talk to um, a really, really famous talk show host uh, whose show is no longer on the air. And this guy spent a couple hours or spent like an hour talking to me. And I'll never forget what he told me. He said, Mel, being a daytime talk show host, doing 175 shows in six months, this is a marathon. He said, the most important thing that you could do is protect your stamina and be kind and patient with yourself. And you're not going to be able to live your normal life. You're not going to be able to go out to dinner with friends because if you tape three shows in a row at CBS Broadcast Center four days a week, you are not going to have energy. And by the way, you can't afford to get sick because the show must go on. And so right now, tell your family and your friends that you love them, but you are about to go into a bunker right now and you are about to focus on this. And then when you come up for air, you will be able to focus on having fun again and being with everyone else. And I think there are times in your life like that. Maybe you're studying for a dissertation. Maybe you are in the middle of applying to medical school. Maybe you're going through a divorce or you've lost somebody that you love and you're grieving. That is a moment of legitimate overwhelm. And the best thing that you could do is identify it, call it out for what it is, and be kinder to yourself and remind yourself that if you are, you'll have the stamina to move through this. And you will move through this. And there will be a time in your life where you will not feel this way. But for now, it's about putting yourself first. And for those of us that are also struggling with lifestyle overwhelm, it's okay, you now know. And now you have free, proven research back tools that you can use. You got your brain dump, you got your rule of three. Remember, it doesn't fucking matter. You can do the photos later. Nobody cares but you. And make it easier. Make it easier, that's it. And this stuff is so powerful. Like it, it works so quickly. You don't realize how quickly you could break out of overwhelm because like me, you've probably been stuck in this vicious cycle for so long that it's just the air you breathe. But there is something so much better that's available to you. You can create a better life. And that's why I wanted you to hear from a listener named Michelle Last. And pay attention to the joy and the lightness in her voice. I wanted to invite Michelle on this walk with us because I want you to know that this is available to you when you finally take back control and you stop letting overwhelm run your life. Holy shit, Mel. I just listened to your podcast on procrastination and it changed everything. You're the first person I've heard talk about money anxiety, oh my God, in a way that resonated with me. And you know what? I paid a credit card bill today that was six months late. I was in freeze mode. And when you said that on the podcast, I burst out crying. I mean, it was like a gut punch and you thawed me. I paid that damn bill this morning. And all of a sudden I realized that I have more time on my hands. Like I was sitting there wondering what I was supposed to do. I had energetic time because I'd been thinking about this bill for six months. I've been torturing myself and holding myself back from my greatness. It's like five, four, three, two, one. I mean, what if it doesn't have to be hard? What if I can do the damn thing? Thank you so much, Mo. I'm really forever grateful. Oh, Michelle, I'm forever grateful. And I'm really proud of you. And the thing I want to really highlight, because I can hear the energetic freedom. I can hear how light you are. And what I want to point out is until you do the damn thing, 
you don't realize how much thinking about something and avoiding it and feeling overwhelmed by it, how much it's robbing you of energy. I relate to that because I feel that way about that damn picture wall. And I've gone through periods of my life where I didn't pay my bills because I couldn't pay my bills, but I thought about my bills all the damn time. Overwhelm is torture. Feeling like you're stuck in a vicious cycle where you got to do more, or you got to move faster, or you got to put this, it's just pressure and it's keeping you stuck there. And so now you know the truth. You can focus. You can prioritize. You can use the rule of three and just focus on doing the important things. Not everything is important. And when you stop acting as if it is, you will able to get done what needs to get done. See, overwhelm goes away the minute you start to take control. And that usually happens, honestly, with a simple pen and a blank piece of paper. That's it. Do the brain dump, pick three things, tell yourself that doesn't fucking matter today. Remind yourself that anything that is an emergency bubbles its way to the top and always ask yourself, how can I make this easier? How can I take the pressure off? How can I do the damn thing? And just pick one of those three and get started. Five, four, three, two, one, pay that bill, make that call, write that next paragraph, roll out that yoga mat, pick up that guitar. Or for me, write that eulogy. And then on the plane ride home, log into Shutterfly and see if you can find all of those photos that used to be stored there. Do what you've been avoiding. Follow the rule of three and give yourself a fucking break if you're feeling legitimate overwhelm because it will be over. But you have a choice over whether or not it's your lifestyle anymore. And for crying out loud, Stop telling yourself those four lies. No, you can't handle it in your head. No, rushing won't make you fit it all in. And no, everything's not of equal importance. And no, you don't need to do more. In fact, you need to do a lot less. You just need to do the things that really matter to you. And when you do that, you, my friend, are going to get your life and all of that energetic time back. And I so want that for you. I feel better. I hope you feel better. I wish you were here so I could give you a hug. You know, after a great walk with a friend, you give each other a hug. And you're like, okay, when are we doing this again? Are we doing this? Uh, yeah, you know when we're doing this again? We're doing this on Thursday. And between now and then, I want to make sure I tell you, I love you. I believe in you. And I believe in your ability to really focus on what matters to you and go create a better life for yourself. Having been somebody that was in a scary place financially just over a decade ago, mm -hmm. I want you to explain what will happen to somebody with crushing student debt or who's having trouble just making the ends meet right now and they don't have a yeah. lot of savings. How will doing this exercise change their psychology about money starting today? Yes, thank you for asking this because if you are in large amounts of debt, whether student loan, credit card, even mortgage for, for some people, some of this can sound really airy-fairy. And I, I'm, I'm the last guy to get accused of us all sitting around the campfire saying kumbaya. I'm like, look, I'll talk about psychology, but we're also going to talk about the numbers. And so what I want to emphasize to people is that we often have this belief that we're overwhelmed with money. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's easy to feel that way. But when I ask people, show me your spending. What percentage of your income is going to housing or investments? I would say 99% of people do not know. Okay, so how can we... I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I, and, and I, so... I literally don't know. Yeah, totally. It's very common. And so how can we feel in control of something if we don't understand the basic mechanics of it. Even when we drive a car, we got to know how to turn the ignition on and you know, reverse. So we go through life in this very uh, arbitrary transactional way of like, 
okay, this bill came in. I'm going to pay it. This bill came in. That feels really bad. It's transactional. It's reactive. And what I'm encouraging you to do is to go from defense to offense with your money. That means once you set the intention of mm. an Italy trip, if you're in crushing debt, you may go, hey, Ramit, I actually cannot afford to put $100 a month away. I go, okay, well, why don't we write that down, $100 a month towards Italy, but you can't do that today. That's totally fine. Next, we're going to go through your four key numbers in the conscious spending plan. Let's make sure you understand your numbers and you will be quite surprised that a lot of people discover they have more money than they actually realized once they go on offense with their personal finances. Oh, wow. Okay. So what are the four type things that we all need to go through? Everybody needs these four numbers. This is what I use instead of a budget. I don't keep a budget. You think I'm going to sit around tracking the price of asparagus for the rest of my life? Hell no. Okay. Oh I don't want to live that kind of life. I don't so want to live that kind numbers. of life either. Okay. Yeah. All right. So four numbers that you should know. These are all part of my conscious spending plan. The first is your fixed costs. Okay. So that would include your rent or mortgage, Yep. your utilities, car payment, gas, insurance, anything that's fixed, even groceries every month that goes there. And, and what about fixed... the minimum debt payment? Or is that part of another yeah, category? Yeah, that's, that okay. counts there exactly. Thank okay. you. And that number, you should try to get it between 50 to 60% of your take home pay. Okay. okay? Let, me, let me run through these all and then I'll tell you what they mean. 50 to 60% of your take home pay for fixed costs. Next up, your savings. How much money are you saving every month? This should be roughly five to 10% of your take home. And savings would be an emergency fund or money you don't need for at least one to five years. Things like a down payment for a house, et cetera. Next up would be investments. Roughly five to 10% of take home, although I like to see it higher because investing early in life pays well, it pays dividends later. Okay. And then a little finally, shame for Mel Robbins did not invest early in life. I'm just going to like <laughs> let that one go and focus on my dream list. Okay. Just wanted to there acknowledge that when you said that because yeah, you know, I mean, look, people not say that. I'm like, fuck, I didn't do that. Okay. Well, I wish I started deadlifting when I was 13 years old, but I didn't even know what that was. You know, so we all start from the place we start at. That's true. Okay. The last category is my favorite one of all. It's guilt free spending. And this is 20 to 35% of take home pay. What? Now, yeah, that's right. Desserts. Mel, go get them. Beautiful cashmere <laughs> coat. That's for me. Go get them. <laughs> you want to go, you want to get roller skates. You want to go to your gym. 20 to 35% of take home. Now, let me tell you why I love this and why I'm getting excited I about four love numbers. This. Okay, so many of us shrink our lives and we agonize over some stupid $5 purchase. You really think coffee is gonna change your life? It's irrelevant. It does not matter how much coffee you buy. So please stop thinking about that. The same people who agonize, I go, oh, I'm so overwhelmed, I don't know anything. I go, what's your savings rate? They go, what's that? How much are you investing? Well, I try, but I don't really know. Okay, how are you supposed to feel not overwhelmed if you don't know any key numbers? So know the four numbers and you will suddenly feel totally in control. Some of you aren't gonna be able to hit these numbers. That's okay, at least we can work with it. We got the puzzle pieces on the table. Now we can start assembling your rich life. Wow, okay, I, I think I can do this. Yeah. So you just like carve out some time on the weekend and get your arms around these four things. Yeah, which should take 15 minutes. Do not no, I, overthink I, it's it. It's going to take me a while. Really? It takes Wait, 15 minutes? Yeah, but here's, what, here's what people do. How do you do, do for, it? You know, because the, the biggest um, challenge is uh, people don't have the right logins. So their logins <laughs> are spread all over. They got their Fidelity account or some old 401k or whatever. So I, I would recommend breaking it up into two days. Okay. The first day is just get all your stuff assembled. Love it. Right? It's like cleaning the garage. And then the second day, 15 minutes and done. Do not overthink it. Okay. We're going for I love you. approximate numbers. Okay. That's it. I love you. I love you, love you, love you. You have that, what is it, the 85% rule? Get 85% yeah. of this right, you're good. Get, yeah, get on with your life. You don't need to sit there and optimize everything. It's a waste of time. And I also love this because, like, it can feel so insurmountable when yeah. you've made major financial mistakes in your life that this gives you a place to start 
that you can then start to get better from. And, and I just actually had a huge wake up moment. Hmm. I realized that one of the great things about growing up with parents who were very like just I didn't ever see any concern about money and I didn't see them talking about it actually that's not true I would see my mother sitting at her desk with one of those little calculators with the tapes as she was okay. balancing her checkbook hey that's a that's a really important thing that you saw you saw a woman taking control of money yes. and obviously and being capable and competent that is a very valuable lesson to learn as a child that that obviously has come through for you that's amazing oh yeah and she then went on to open her own retail store and i i come all the women wow. like my grandmother is a farmer and ran the money and she had a calculator with the tape amazing. and my other grandmother my grandparents had a bakery and she had the thing with the tape but what's interesting is that i think the oh, it's chill aspect has gotten too hands off for me. Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. fact that I can't answer those numbers like that at this stage in my life, for me, it used to be because of fear and shame and how bad the numbers were. I used to be one of those people that the bills would arrive and I would just not open them. Yeah, common. And because it was confronting to see the debt and confronting to see how much I had spent because I was, you know, basically shopping to escape my life with money that I did not afford or, or, or that I didn't have. And then you'd open up the bills and be like, fuck. Yeah, I and guess I spent that much. Yeah, I, I, I don't have that money. And yeah. so I, it used to be that, but I think now that I've paid off all the debt and I have savings and I've, you know, maniacally saving, mm -hmm. I don't look at it at all still. Okay, let's let's talk about a couple of things that are so interesting about what you just said. I love the honesty. All of us have something in our lives that we are, we feel like we should be doing better. Mm -hmm. And we kind of push the envelopes away. And I, I deeply understand this because for me, it was fitness. And I grew up half joking, calling myself a skinny Indian guy. And I really wish I had not said that because it became part of my identity. Mm. And, you know, if, if any of us say something like, I'm bad with money, oh. I would gently encourage you to not say that. Maybe reframe it and say, gosh, I haven't learned the skills of money yet, but I'm changing that now. I want to so stop right gentle. there. Hold on a second. I apologize for interrupting you, but this is so important. Yeah. If you just heard Ramit say, I'm bad with money. I want you to pay attention loud and clear because he's absolutely right. Or if you say something like, I, I don't understand, it's overwhelming. Yeah, I'm not good with math. I'm not good with math. What are other things that your students say, Ramit, that really crystallize a terrible psychology around money? Uh, my family's never been good with money. We're all bad. Um, I'm never going to get out of this debt. Um, we always fight about money. And I'm just an overspender. Or my husband yeah. took care of the finances. Oh, classic. Oh, that drives me insane. Oh, hold on. I'm getting mad. But I got. I'm getting mad at multiple things right now. So let me take them each in turn. Okay. First off, um, what you said about not opening envelopes and then now as you've become much more financially successful – it's almost swung the other way, is totally common. In my experience, once people start earning around $150,000, they stop really paying attention to the numbers because they basically make enough to not have to really pay attention. And actually, I'm a little okay with that. I don't want people agonizing over the price of groceries if they're making 150 k But what I do want and what I do for myself is I spend one hour per month on my finances. That's it, just one hour. I review the CSP. My wife and I talk about money. Hold on. The CSP uh, was that conscious spending plan of the four correct. things. Fixed cost, uh, what's your automatic sa savings, your investments, and then the, the category I love the most, guilt-free fucking spending people. Let's there you go. Well, okay. I love it. You added the F word. That's so good. <laughs> I got to add that. That's beautiful. It, it is exciting. Okay. So all those things. When you have money carved out for guilt-free spending, 
it is literally defined so that if you want to eat and get an extra cheesecake or you want to go to the movies, like you don't have to feel guilty because you know my debt is being paid off, my rent or mortgage is being covered. I'm even saving money. I'm not trying to save money just like I don't try to brush my teeth. It is happening automatically. It's even better than brushing. So that is, if you're listening, I hope that's a sense of relief that you don't have to feel bad about having debt. You do not have to track a gajillion numbers that you don't even care about. You do, and I would highly encourage you to focus on four key numbers that will totally transform your life. I love this. I love how easy you're making this. Thank you for that. It's absolutely my pleasure. I, I, I don't want to spend time doing that either. I don't want anyone else to waste their so time on it. So may I just, I, I want to clarify one thing. Hmm. So these four pillars of the conscious spending plan. And again, I come from the lived experience of crushing debt. Yeah. Where you feel that unless you can get to zero balance, you don't deserve guilt-free spending. Yeah. That somehow you're cheating on your goal to get out of debt, which is what every financial advisor pounds into your head. Yeah. And you feel like that latte robs you of the opportunity to be out of debt. You feel like spending to go on a trip with your friends robs you of the ability to be out of debt. And what you're saying is, no, 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 no. You can start right now by figuring out these four things and allocating incoming to those things. Correct. We have a very unhealthy relationship with money in this country. On one hand, we have a puritanical uh, strain that tells us do not buy anything and you're a bad person for having debt and you should live in a monastery until that debt is paid off. And then <laughs> yes. maybe you can go buy a pack of gum. Okay. On the other hand, we're like, uh, okay, hold on. Let me look at Instagram. Oh, my friend's in Bora Bora on Tuesday. Ooh, I think I'm going to go uh, take a trip, even though I don't even know how much I have in the bank. What a two paradoxical beliefs. And usually it's the consumerist one that wins, but we still feel guilty. Yes. We love to feel guilty yes. in this country. I don't really know what, I don't want to feel guilty with money. I don't, also, I'm not naturally like, I don't feel guilty. I'm just like, let me just fix this. So um, when it comes to having debt, Here's my belief. Uh, number one, you need to know how much you owe. 90% of people I talk to who are in debt do not even know how much debt they owe. That's number one. You've got to know your numbers. Number two, you've got to know the exact month and year your debt will be paid off. 95% of people in debt do not know their debt payoff plan. Easy way to do it, literally go on Google, type debt payoff calculator, plug your numbers in, and you will see. And don't worry if it seems depressing. Oh, it's going to take 28 years. What I want you to do is just plug the number in and sit with it for a day. And later, you will learn things like, wow, if I add an extra $50 a month, it can shave off three years from my debt. But that comes later. I just and, want and you to And you know what else I also love it. that you're saying is I love that you're saying it's okay to have it. Like most rich yeah. people actually finance a lot of things. Yeah. And, it's, and it's yeah. And that debt is, go ahead. You're the expert. Uh, I don't know why the hell I'm talking about money. Go ahead. <laughs> well, first of all, whether it's okay or not, a lot of people have debt. Yes. So let's just accept us for who we are. That's yes. that's the fact of life. Now, I do want you to get smarter with debt. So there when I look at people, I always look at the snapshot of their finances. And I talk about all these numbers on the podcast, by the way. We have folks who come on eight hundred thousand dollars of debt. They're not even sure really. Are you serious? Well, that was me uh, over a decade ago. Yeah, when the liens wow. hit the house. Okay. No so college this... savings, no 401k, wow. credit cards maxed out, home equity Amazing. line maxed out, plowed it all into my husband's restaurant business, did not go according to plan. I lost my job. Liens hit the house. He hadn't been paid in six months. Friends and family had invested. Holy fucking hell. That was my life. Okay. So this, so you really know Oh, what it's like. Yeah, this is not it's, a joke. This is It's like um you think about it every day of your life when you're in it. Yes. And in fact, there's research I believe that says that the number is 75 or $78,000 in the United States is what you need to make in order to be relieved of the day-to-day -day financial stress that you have. 
that when you reach that number, there's a level of freedom involved. I don't know if that's true or not. I I know the research. Um, What is it? It's not that it, people have wildly misinterpreted it. Let me put it this way. And I want to correct it because people listening who are making $75,000, they're like, wait a second. Why do I still feel so stressed? What's wrong with me? Right. And there's not, there's not something wrong with you. Nobody is broken with money. Nobody. There are ways for you to get uh, informed about money. So you know the basic language of money, which anybody can do. You do not have to be a math genius. I'm not. And second, to work on improving your money psychology. You know, I, I spoke to a couple on my podcast and uh, they were in a lot of financial trouble and they, you know, they think about it every day and they were so stressed out. <clears throat> and I asked them, have you read my book? Not judging. It turns out like almost nobody who comes on my podcast reads my book, which I find hilarious. And so I said, okay. Uh, and they go, well, you know, I don't really, I haven't really read a lot. I said, okay, you're a new parent. She was a mom. I think her baby was about like six months old. I said, um, when you first had your baby, did you know how to hold her? She Mm. goes, no. Did you know how to feed her? No. Did you just wing it? Did did you just try your best, you know? No, I got help. The nurses, my mom, I read a bunch of books and on and on and on. And that is so normal. There are things in life we don't know, that's okay. But we do have to say, hey, this is important to me. My rich life is important. I deserve to dream bigger than a box of pickles. And therefore, (laughs) I'm going to prioritize learning and also improving my psychology. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe.